Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Daniel Diermeyer. I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. And on behalf of the Harris School, the Friends, Friends uh, Chicago Center um, and the Center for International Study, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our event this evening. Um, I also want to uh, do a quick shout out to the Becker Friedman Institute, who um, co hosted uh, with us today a lunch event uh, uh, with Thomas Piketty, and it was a wonderful event, and I want to thank, thank them for their collaboration. I would also like to welcome those joining us via webcast, including the Marianne Midwest Network, which includes um, viewers um, from a variety of universities. Um, and uh, Alliance Francaise locations in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Nebraska, Kentucky, and Missouri to hear Professor Piketty tonight. Uh, we will also have the possibility to submit questions via the internet um, in the Q&A period that will follow the conversation. I see we have a packed house tonight. Uh, no wonder, given the worldwide interest in Thomas Piketty's research on wealth and income inequality, and I too look, I'm looking forward to hearing him speak. Um, I should say, uh, as a little personal remark, uh, Thomas and I first met 19 years ago at a beautiful conference in Switzerland in Gerzensee, uh, when we were still young and full of promise, and at least one of us has fulfilled it. So uh, <laughs> I very much look forward to his, his, uh, his conversation and his remarks today. Um, at the Harris School, uh, we are committed um, to free and open inquiry, to figure out what are the best public policy solutions. Um, we have a tradition um, that um, quantitative rigorous inquiry is really the best guide uh, for public policy solutions. And as part of this commitment, we are always trying to bring the best minds to campus to share their ideas with us and engage in a conversation. We are very grateful to Thomas Piketty for, for being able to join us tonight. And I would now like to welcome Kervin Charles, the Edwin and Betty L. Berkman Distinguished Service Professor at Harris to the stage to introduce Professor Thomas Piketty. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would let's quickly want to run down for you our plan about how the events of the evening will unfold. And so I'm going to introduce him. He'll come and speak. Immediately following his discussion, or his comments, we'll have a discussion, the two of us. And that discussion will be centered around some questions of mine, some questions we have from remote guests who will be emailing them to me, and questions of yours. And so we are very mindful of the fact that he has not had a chance yet to respond to your questions. To make sure things go smoothly, the plan is for you to write questions during his lecture, and in between the conclusion of his speech and the beginning of the discussion section, you will pass your questions to the people who will come down the aisle. Okay? We'll have a short discussion and then we'll go. So having dispensed with that, let me turn to my first task of the evening. And so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Thomas Piketty to you tonight. Professor Piketty is a professor at the Paris School of Economics who has done path-breaking and very influential research on economic inequality, among other things. Working with various co-authors over a number of years, he has produced arguably the most comprehensive empirical description of inequality and its evolution over several decades. His numerous publications include the best-selling book, Capital in the 21st Century, on the outlook of global inequality. His work highlights the role of political and fiscal institutions in the historical evolution of income and wealth distributions and suggests policy interventions to address these phenomena. Piketty earned his Master of Science degree in Mathematics from École Normale Supérieure and earned his PhD in Economics from EHESS and the LSA. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Piketty.
thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you to the Ari School for uh, for inviting me and making this possible. So I, I you know, I hope my uh, French English will be uh, understandable for for you. And uh, I, I I'm, you know, in this lecture, I would like to present a number of. Uh, findings and reflection uh, coming from my book uh, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, so le let, me, let me start right away by, by saying that so, you know, this presentation is going to be based on my book. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I have written such a long book and you know, it's, uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to read it all. You can, you can have access to all the series uh, uh, here. You know, I'm sorry I cannot put the book online. My publisher would uh, disagree, but uh, you know, I'm sure you can find it somewhere if you. If you... <laughs> uh, so, so today, you know, I will present some of the findings from this book. Be before I do that, you know, I really want to stress that this work comes from a very collective uh, research program. So I've been. Uh, start, you know, I've been working on the history of inequality for, uh, for a long time, uh, uh, almost 15 years, and I was very fortunate uh, to have uh, many uh, co-authors and collaborators, uh, uh, Tony Atkinson, Emmanuel Saez, uh, uh, Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, Facundo Alvaredo, from several dozen countries, and, and this book is really trying to give a consistent interpretation for all this body of historical data that we have been putting together. L let me say right away that you know, we still know too little about uh, uh, inequality dynamics, so we know a little bit more than we used to, uh, but this is, uh, this is still too little, and so the interpretation for the data that we found that I am proposing in this book and that I will propose today, you know, it's not supposed to be uh, definitive. You know, I, I, I you know, welcome uh, controversy, welcome discussion. You know, the purpose of this book was to stimulate discussion about inequality, and you know, I'm very glad that I have uh, achieved uh, this objective. And and this is, um, and you know, the debate will continue. You know, we will put putting new data online and putting new interpretation and, and hopefully we will learn more in the coming years that we, we know at this, at this stage. So today I'm, I'm going to present some of the findings, but if you want to know more about the data set from the different countries, you can also look at this website. So the countries in red are already in the database, countries in blue are entering the database, and one of the good uh, impact I think of the publication of the book is that we now have more countries uh, where we are able to access the fiscal data. So you can see Mexico or Brazil, for which we, following the publication of the book, we obtain uh, access to fiscal archives which we could not access before. Uh, and and uh, so we, you know, this, this, uh, this includes you know countries uh, uh, also in in Asia uh, that are not covered in my book. And you know, it's not that I was not interested in all these emerging countries, but just that we didn't have access uh, to the data. Until, uh, until recently. So uh, I will not present the findings from all countries today, but, but if you want to see some of the, of the findings, you can, you can go to this website. So in this presentation, I'm going to try to focus on three, three points. First point will be about the long run dynamics of income inequality. Uh, second point and third point will be about wealth accumulation and wealth inequality. Uh, you know, to some extent, I think that in the long run, wealth dynamics are even more important than income dynamics. But of course, both are important and both are very related uh, because more inequality of income uh, also tends to lead to more concentration of wealth in the long run. But there are specific uh, mechanisms involved with wealth accumulation and distribution, which are not simply the translation of income inequality, and, and I think these are uh, important. So the first point will be about the long-run dynamics of income inequality. Second point will be about the evolution of aggregate wealth relative to income, and third point about the uh, wealth inequality uh, in itself. So le let me start with the, the first point about uh, income inequality, and this is where this whole process uh, started. Here, probably the main finding is what I call here the end of the Kuznets curve, also the end of sort of universal deterministic laws about income inequality, and the conclusion that in the end it's really the institution and policies uh, that determine uh, uh, the long-run dynamics of income uh, income inequality. So the the first. Um, uh, 
finding, uh, you know, I will, I will present three facts about inequality in the long run in this presentation. One about income inequality and another one about wealth inequality, another one about wealth income ratio. These three facts are presenting in a, in a very uh, 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 condensed manner in this paper with uh, Saez, which you can find online. Uh, that was published in Science in 2014. So the, the good thing about Science is that they want you to be really short. So this is a five-page article. So you know, <laughs> if you don't want to read the book, you know, you can at least read this five page and, and you get the substance uh, uh, of it. Well, some of the substance of it. So fa fact number one is that if you look at the long-run evolution of income inequality, you have a reversal between Europe and the US. So Europe used to have more inequality of income uh, a century ago, and now it's the opposite. So this reversal is interesting in itself because it shows that you don't have, uh, uh, you know, it's not that some countries have a preference for inequality as compared to others. These things can change over time depending on, on um, uh, institution, policies, and changing perceptions about inequality. So le let me show you a simple graph illustrating this. So this is the share of total income going to the top 10%. So Europe is uh, here to simplify. This is the weighted average of, uh, of Germany, Britain, France, Sweden. So this is not entirely Europe, but it's a big part of Western Europe, and the evolutions in Europe are, are sort of similar. So you, you can see first the orders of magnitude is that the, so the share of total income going to the top 10% of the distribution. So if it was complete equality, it should be 10% if everybody had the same income. Complete inequality should be 100%. Now, in practice, it's typically between 30 and 50%. Well, you have countries in the world where it can be even more than 50%, like in South Africa, it would be maybe 60 or 65%, or in Brazil, 55 or 60%. But the, the typical orders of magnitude will be between 30 and 50% for the top 10. And you can see that these things change over time. So you have a big decline in inequality in the first half of the 20th century, uh, which is what Kuznets found in the 1950s. And all what we've been doing, in a way, is to extend Kuznets' work to many more years, many more countries. And, and you can see that this changes quite a, a lot the, the perspective, because in the recent decade, we have a, a return to pretty high inequality level by historical standards um, uh, in Europe, and, and most importantly in the US, where, uh, to, you know, as of now, we are close to, to 50%. So these are... In this presentation, I will sometimes show you uh, decennial averages uh, series such as this one, so that everything looks very smooth because we focus on long-run trends. But real life uh, is not always uh, smooth, and so it's also interesting to look at the annual series that are behind these decennial averages. So this is the same graph for the US, except that here I have, uh, I have annual points. And so you can see, you know, especially when you include capital gains, that you have a lot, you know, very strong cycles in inequality. So typically in 2001 and 2 and 2 or 2008 or 9, it's not a good time to have capital gains and, and to uh, realize your capital gains. But then after the crash, you know, the capital gains increase again. Now, even when you exclude the capital gains entirely, you clearly have a strong trends uh, toward the rising uh, share. So you can see in 2012, uh, when you include the capital gains, you are above uh, 2007, which itself was above 1928, okay? just before the, the 1929 crash. So looking at this graph, of course, many, many people thought, okay, maybe you know, there is a relation uh, between uh, inequality and financial crisis. It's not necessarily causal uh, in the sense that uh, you have common factors typically stock market boom in the 20s or in the before 2007, which increase inequality because typically top income groups make large uh, capital gains and which tend to fragilize the financial system. So that doesn't necessarily mean the, the link between inequality and, and financial crisis. Closed. I think, though, that it's partly causal in the sense that uh, I think many people now agree that the, the big rise in inequality in the year before 2007 contributed not only to the stagnation uh, of median incomes in the US, but also to the rise of household debt, and probably contributed also to some extent to fragilize uh, the financial system. But I'm not going to talk too much about the uh, implication about uh, financial fragility in this talk, and I will focus mostly on the interpretation for the long run uh, 
long run uh, evolution. Uh, so you can see the, the long period from the 1950s to the 1970s uh, is a period of relative stability of inequality at a relatively low level which is when the Kuznets curve ID was proposed, so the idea is that you have in advanced stages of development, you have a natural reduction of inequality and then a stabilization at a lower level of inequality. So this was, you know, the, the, this period of the 50s, 60s, 70s is really the sort of the post-war ideal of a balanced growth path where everybody is growing, is going up at the same speed. Okay, when you have a stable share for the top 10%, it means that if you have a GDP growth rate of 2% or 3% a year in 1960 or 1970, everybody goes up at 2 or 3%. It means that the average income of the top 10% goes up at 2%. The average income of the bottom 90 goes up at 2%. So this is what a stable share means. So in a way, you know, you have rich people, you have poor people, but everybody goes up at the same speed, so you don't care too much about inequality. That's, uh, the gro growth is all what you... Now, in the recent period, it's a different story because, you know, when you go from one third to one half of total income going to the top 10 percent, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, where, where is this going to stop? And, and so, you know, some people seem to believe that wherever it goes will be fine, that, you know, this will be the optimum. But at some point, you know, I think it's important to look at the numbers. Here, we are not talking just about a small group of people who are making more than average. We are talking of changes which are of uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, significance. Uh, is it going to stop uh, right at 50 percent? Is it going to go to 60 percent, 70 percent 20 years from now? We, we are talking about such big numbers that I think we, we have to uh, take seriously uh, the issue of how how we can explain this. So we don't have perfect explanation for this, but by comparing in particular different international experience, I think we can try to get to, to better explanation. And I think these comparisons are very important. You know, many countries tend to uh, not to look too much at other countries' experience, and this happens sometimes in the in the US, but you know, this happens also uh, in other countries as well. You know, the feeling that each country is unique, and we don't have anything to learn from others. But you know, I think in the end, this is uh, one of the main uh, uh, ways to learn about what's going on. So, what's really striking is that you don't have the same rise of inequality everywhere. So you see in Europe, this is clearly much less spectacular than in the US. If you put Japan on the picture, which is the other part of the rich world, uh, it's sort of in between Europe and the US and closer to Europe in some ways. So how do we account for this? Uh, you know, the first point is that this rise in income inequality is mostly due, at least until today, to a rise of inequality of labor income. Now, inequality of capital income and capital ownership is, is now starting to become more and more important, and there's some recent work by Saez Zuckman showing that the, the rise in wealth concentration in, in the U.S. Uh, has actually been probably even larger than what I report in my book when the research was not uh, available. Uh, uh, but for now, you know, the biggest part for the past three decades was really the rise uh, in the inequality of labor income. Now, this is clearly due to a mixture of reasons. You know, it's not that there's only one explanation. There's a mixture of explanation. Uh, changing supply and demand for skill, which is the usual uh, explanation that economists have, is certainly uh, a, a very uh, important explanation. You know, skill bias, technical change, race between education and technology. Globalization, you know, the fact that emerging countries like China have entered the world labor market, uh, thereby putting pressure on bottom income groups and bottom skill and medium skill groups in rich countries. That's certainly very important. Now, that's not enough to explain all the cross-country variations that we have. Okay? Because you know, globalization happened not only in the US, but also in, in Sweden, in Germany, in Japan, in France, in all over Europe. And so you, know, you need something more than just globalization if you want to explain this very important uh, cross-country variation. Uh, I think here, there are several explanations. One is maybe uh, probably more unequal access to skills and education in the US, where you have very good uh, top universities, as we all know, but, but the bottom half of the population, uh, not only they don't go to the University of Chicago or Harvard, but there's a kind of uh, high school and community college they go to when, when they go to college. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's of a quality which is clearly not comparable to what you have at the top. So the inequality in, in, in uh, educational investment 
investment uh, has grown over this period, particularly in the US, and probably this is an important part of the explanation for, for the much bigger rise of, of supply of skill and therefore inequality of labor earnings uh, in the US. Uh, rising tuition, insufficient public investment in education is, is, uh, is, is certainly playing an important role. Now, this is not, you know, this education story cannot explain everything. In particular, you also have an unprecedented rise of uh, very top managerial compensation, which is difficult to explain simply on the basis of education and productivity. Or at least, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you compare companies who are paying uh, their managers uh, $10 million rather than one, you know, it's difficult to find in the data the kind of uh, extra performance or job creation or, you know, that, that could justify this simply uh, on, the, on, the, on the basis of a, of a productivity-based uh, story. So I think here, uh, uh, corporate governance and, you know, sometimes uh, the ability of, of top managers to put the right people in the right compensation session committee uh, is, is more important than simply the supply and demand for skills uh, uh, and probably uh, uh, a transformation of the, of the income tax progressivity in the US which used to have one of the most progressive income tax system in the world and that has become one of the least progressive may have uh, uh, contributed to this change by, by increasing the incentives for top managers to, uh, to, to try to bargain very aggressively for higher pay. Transformation of labor market institution, uh, declining role of unions, declining minimum wage certainly played a role as well. So wh whatever you believe about the exact combination of explanation between unequal access to education, corporate governance, tax policy, uh, uh, labor market institution, clearly these are uh, country-specific institutions that, that must uh, explain why some countries uh, following globalization are able to, uh, to uh, deal with it in a way such that broader part of the population can benefit from globalization and, and, uh, and inequality does not increase in the same proportion. So just to emphasize a bit more this, you know, this is the evolution of the minimum wage in uh, France and the US. So the minimum wage used to be a lot higher in the US. It is now higher, higher in France. So these are dollars and euros of 2013. And I have put one euro equal 1.2 dollars, which is roughly purchasing power parity as of today. So this is comparable. The levels are comparable. Uh, you know, you remember Obama at the beginning of 2015 proposed to increase the federal minimum wage to 10 dollars, which will be uh, it's 7.2, the federal minimum wage right now. So returning to 10 dollars will just be uh, going back to the 1960s, okay? Because in 1960 the real value in dollars of 2013 was, was, uh, was a little bit more than, than 10 dollars. So this is, I think this is quite unusual to see an absolute decline of 25% of the, of the real value of the minimum wage in half a century. Uh, and, and clearly this must have an impact uh, this must have had an impact on the evolution of, of inequality of pay, uh, at least in the bottom part uh, in the US. So this is just an example of one of the labor market institutions which matters. Now, inequality in access to education is probably even more important. So this comes from work by uh, uh, Emmanuel Saez and Raj Shetty. So this is in the US. Uh, Right now, basically, this was measured, uh, in, I think the period is 2008 to 2012, so this is exactly uh, the situation today. So you have the parental income rank, you have the percentile of children attending college. So, you know, it's almost the first diagonal. You, you go almost from 0% to 100%. Well, not quite. You know, if your parents are very poor, you still have a 20% chance to go to college. And if your parents are in the top 10 percent, you have only a 90 percent chance to go to college. So you know it's not, you know, it's not. It doesn't go from zero to 100. It goes from 90 to 20 to 90. But and of course, when you go to college, you're in the bottom group. You don't go to the same college and people at the upper groups. Uh, so so I think this is quite striking because this is I think a clear illustration of the enormous gap that you have between the official discourse about meritocracy, equal opportunity, etc., and the reality of what's happening. So I think it's, it's important, you know, 
I think there's a lot of imagination sometimes among the elites uh, to justify, uh, you know, inequality, and, and so not only in the U.S., uh, in France also, everywhere. Uh, but I think, you know, it's important to put these claims about equal opportunity under public scrutiny and to, you know, have access to data uh, in order to see, you know, what's, what's really happening, uh, to see what's happening also in the uh, uh, university admission systems, the way they are biased toward uh, higher income groups. And I, I think, you know, it's important to, to follow what's happening uh, uh, in this kind of dimension. And this uh, very unequal access to education in the end has, of course, very strong consequences on the overall uh, inequality of, of labor earnings. Now, let me turn now to wealth accumulation and wealth distribution. So, of course, wealth distribution uh, is to some extent the, the consequence of, of, uh, of uh, income distribution. So, everything I have said about the determinants of income inequality, education, minimum wage, progressive taxation is also going to have an impact on the inequality uh, uh, of saving and ability to accumulate wealth between the different income groups, so this will have an impact on, on wealth inequality. But there are other mechanisms which enter the scene when we want to analyze uh, uh, wealth inequality. So here I'm going to start by, by going very quickly through uh, something which plays a very important role in my book, which is about the evolution of the aggregate uh, market value of wealth and also about what I call the metamorphosis of capital ownership uh, by which I mean the evolution of the different form of wealth over the long run from agricultural land to real estate, business assets, financial assets and let me make very clear that each of these different type of asset has a different history. You need to open the black box if you want to understand what's going on. And when you just make the big sum, the big addition, uh, there's no way you can understand everything. And that's part of the reason why my book is a bit long, is because I try to dig into each of these assets and, and study the, you know, how the history of agricultural land and business assets and real estate and foreign capital and public debt, you know, involve different mechanisms. So I'm not going to be able to do that here, but, and I'm going to show you mostly a graph about the overall evolution of wealth to income ratio, but you have to keep in mind that it's, it's, you really need to dig into the different form of assets. The, what you need to have in mind also is that the concentration of wealth and property is always a lot higher than income inequality. Uh, but that wealth inequality today is still less extreme than what it was uh, a century ago, particularly in Europe, in spite of the fact that the aggregate value of wealth relative to national income has now recovered from the big 20th century shock. So that's why it's important to distinguish between the aggregate value of wealth and the concentration because they do not follow uh, exactly the same evolution. So if you look at the concentration of wealth, so remember for income, the orders of magnitude were that the share of the top 10% was between 30 and 50%. Now you can see that wealth is always much more concentrated than income because it always go, it's always more than 50% for the top 10. It goes typically from 60 to 90%. Uh, uh, not that, you know, there's no reason necessarily why wealth should be so much more concentrated than income. It already tells you something about the mechanism, the underlying mechanism. You know, there are many economic models where actually uh, it should be either less wealth concentration than income concentration, if you think of a model based on precautionary savings, or uh, it should have the same level of concentration approximately if you think of a model of a life cycle saving where uh, inequality and wealth should be more or less a translation of inequality of labor income later in life. So the fact that there is so much more concentration of wealth than income suggests that you, know, you need, in addition to precautionary saving, life cycle uh, saving models, to add something else. You need to have dynamic uh, models of wealth transmission uh, with either large random shocks in rates of return or large intergenerational transmission of wealth or at least long horizon uh, uh, transmission and cumulative process for wealth concentration uh, in order to, to explain this. What's also useful to have in mind is that whatever does not belong to the top 10% belongs to what I call in the book the middle class, which I define as the middle 40% of the distribution, who are in between the top 10% and the 
bottom 50 person. So the bottom 50 person in terms of wealth uh, uh, is always very close to, to zero, basically. So right now in the US, the share in aggregate wealth of the bottom 50 person is uh, between 2 and 3 percent. So you know, it's not exactly zero, but, but it's, uh, it's very close. Okay? And in every country for which we have data, it's typically less than 5 percent, sometimes between 5 and 10 percent uh, in Scandinavia. But it's always very, very small. So whatever does not belong to the top 10, typically belongs to the bottom, uh, the middle 40. Let me make clear that you have roughly the same level of concentration within each age group. Okay, so it's not, it's not mostly an age effect. You, you find this within, within age group uh, as well. So uh, how do you explain this? Well, you know, the first part of the story to look at before we explain the evolution of wealth inequality is to note that the aggregate value of wealth has gone through very important transformation over time, particularly in Europe, because European countries have been hit by very large shocks uh, following World War I, World War II. This decline uh, in Germany, France, UK is partly due to wealth destruction, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in France and Germany. But for the most part, you know, for France and Germany, we can estimate that about one third was due to wealth destruction, and the other two thirds are due either to the lack of investment during this period, because most of the private savings was used to finance the war which themselves was used to, to destroy the rest of the capital stock, which is, you know, <laughs> this is a stupid story, but you know, this is the story of Europe, you know, what, what uh, and the other part, you know, the third third of the explanation is that it's more policy induced. The fact that in 1950, you have a whole set of policies that reduce uh, the private value of wealth, like rent control, or reduce the private value of housing, or nationalization, or regulation. That doesn't necessarily mean a reduction in the volume of capital. It's more the market uh, price of capital, so it's always important to distinguish between the volume and price effect when you look at, at, uh, at this, and I, I, I try to do it uh, carefully in the, in the book. Uh, the other uh, uh, issue that you, that you need to have in mind is that you see if you look at annual series over the more recent period, you see a general rise in private wealth to national income ratio. So this is, again, the aggregate value of private wealth. Typically, half of it is housing on average, and half of it is financial assets, business assets. When I, I talk about private capital or private wealth, this is always net of debt. Of course, this is a net wealth concept, because if you have a lot of financial assets, a lot of debt, it's not really wealth. So you can see that in every country, so these are the top eight developed economies in the world, and all countries were between two and three years of national income in net private household wealth in 1970, and now all countries are between four and seven years. Okay, so clearly you have a general pattern. Uh, so, you know, sometime in textbook, in economic textbook, you hear that wealth to income ratio or capital to output ratio are supposed to be stable. No, you can see, you know, be careful with economic textbooks, you know, sometimes in, in economics when we don't know much about something, we just assume it's a constant, which, uh, you know, of course, if you have only one data point, everything is a constant, but, but when, you have, when you have more data, in fact, there's really no reason why it should be a constant, you know, even in the most standard, in, in the simplest model of capital accumulation, uh, the, the equilibrium level of capital to income really depends, of, of course, on how much you save and invest. You know, if you save twice as much, you will get to a, to a ratio that's twice as large, relative to how fast you grow in terms of underlying population growth and productivity growth. Now, when you move to this simple model of uh, one good uh, capital accumulation to more complicated multi-sector model where you have the relative price of housing, the relative price of the stock market, then it's even more complicated, and you have even more reasons for having very different possible equilibrium level of the capital to income ratio. So housing prices and stock market prices movement play a big role in this evolution. You know, look at Japan between 1985 and 1989. Clearly, this is the housing bubble. You know, even with the Japanese saving rate, uh, you cannot become so rich uh, so fast. You, know, you cannot accumulate two years of national income in just four years. So you will need to have a net of depreciation saving rate of 50% for, for a year. So capital accumulation takes time. If you, 
save 10 persons per year, you need 50 years to accumulate 5 years of national income. So when you have such fast movement, very fast, it must be because of price effect, uh, which play a very important role. Look at the, the Spanish bubble uh, uh, in uh, 2007, 2008, that's even bigger than the Japanese bubble. So Having a very high wealth to income ratio is not necessarily bad in itself. You know, this could come together with perfect equality. You know, if everybody has an equal share in the stock market and the housing stock, uh, you, know, you, you know, there is no problem in having a high wealth to income ratio. Actually, it can be good, you know, in an aging society, you may want to accumulate more wealth. And, you know, that's partly what's going on. But it creates new policy challenges. Well, first, because in practice, you have a lot of inequality in wealth, so in particular at the end of the period, these very high housing prices also mean that for the new generation who don't have family wealth, uh, uh, it's going to be difficult to access property. So that can be an, an issue. Also, it creates new policy challenge in terms of financial regulation, because when you have a ratio of wealth to income at six or seven or eight years, uh, you know, if you make a small mistake on the price of your housing stock in, in Spain, you know, a 10% mistake is going to have enormous consequences for the real economy, much more than when the ratio of wealth to income was two or three years. So these are issues to have in mind. It's also important to have in mind that this big rise in, in private wealth has gone together with a decline of public wealth. So it's partly a transfer from public to private wealth. So public wealth is defined in the same way as private wealth. It's the difference between assets and debt. So over this time period, you, you tend to have a decline in public assets through uh, privatization policies in a number of countries, and you have an increase in public debt. So look at Italy. You know, Italy has, a, has negative public capital in 2010, which means that even if the Italian government was to sell all the public assets, public uh, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, public financial assets, although they don't have much, but uh, even if they were to sell everything, that would not be enough to reimburse the public debt. So that's what the negative uh, 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 public capital means. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because Italy is at the bottom of the class for public capital, it's at the top of the class for private capital, partly, of course, because it is the Italian household sector that has bought some of the privatized public asset and some of the public debt. So partly it reflects a transfer from public to private wealth, but you can see that even in the case of Italy, that's only part of the explanation. You know, the, the, the decline in public wealth has been much less than the increase in private wealth. So sometimes in the discussion, we only focus on the public debt. I think it's important to have a broader view of capital accumulation, to look at public assets and to look at, at uh, private assets also. So, you know, in the end, uh, national capital, which is the sum of private public capital, has increased over the time period. Okay? So, you know, in other words, you know, rich countries uh, uh, are rich. Uh, they, they, it's, they, it is their government which are poor, which creates a number of difficulties, but, but this is a much better situation than if we were all poor. So, so I think it's important to, to have this in mind in many of the discussions we have uh, in particular about the, the public debt uh, crisis. Now, I would like, you know, I'm going to return to the issue of wealth inequality now. And, and uh, so, so far, I have talked mostly about aggregate wealth accumulation. Now, I would like to focus in the last part of my talk about the, the future of wealth concentration. So, you know, what is the determinants of wealth inequality? So, we have seen in a previous graph that wealth inequality today, you know, is less extreme than uh, uh, 100 years ago, but, but it has been increasing recently and it is, it is extremely high, which means that there is a shrinking middle class, a shrinking share of national wealth uh, in a country like the US going to this middle 40%. It used to be close to 30%, it's now closer to 20%, so it's clearly going in the wrong direction if, if one believes that you know, a strong middle class in the, in the distribution of, of national wealth is, is, uh, is uh, important. So what about the future? Can we predict the very long run level of wealth concentration? Well, this is very complicated. This involves lots of factors that I have already listed, the evolution of uh, inequality of labor earnings, uh, inequality in saving rate between the bottom income groups, the uh, upper income groups. Another dimension which I would like now to stress is the gap between uh, the rate of return to uh, capital, uh, in particular for large financial portfolio, 
and the growth rate of the economy. And what you, what you can show is that in a very large class of model, if you take as given all the other reasons which generate wealth inequality, uh, uh, shocks to labor earnings, uh, shocks to the demographic structure, number of children, uh, uh, life expectancy, etc., a higher gap between the rate of return and the growth rate uh, will, um, will tend to amplify uh, wealth inequality in the, in the long run. So I, I understand I have, uh, I have five minutes, which is exactly what I need, so this is perfect. <laughs> So this is some of the data that I would like to show you in the, in the, last, in the last minute. So this is data coming from the Forbes uh, rankings of world billionaires. Let, let me make very clear that this is not a particularly reliable data. And, you know, I am a bit shameful to show this to you. You know, it would be better, you know, I, I would prefer to be able to show you data coming from the IMF or from Eurostat or from official uh, US government uh, statistics, except that you wouldn't find the data, you know, so because there is a lack of financial transparency and a lack of uh, good administrative data on wealth. Uh, you know, we have to do with what we have and, and for the time being, at least for the very top of the distribution, probably the Forbes ranking are more reliable than what we have, in, for instance, in self-reported uh, survey data. Also recently, the, the methods that Saez and Zuckman have been developing using uh, uh, income tax return and capital income flow is sort of consistent with, with what we get with the Forbes ranking, so, so you know, maybe that's worth looking at. This is what we have, not for the US, but at the world level. So I start in 1987 because this is when Forbes start publishing their uh, global rankings of billionaires. So usually what people do with this uh, list of billionaires is they just say, uh, okay, we have more and more uh, billionaires every year, but you know, it's not too surprising in a growing world economy that you have more and more billionaires every year. So what I do here is slightly more sophisticated, which is to take a fixed fraction of the world population, because the world population is also rising, I take a fixed fraction of the world population at the top and I look at how the average wealth of this group has been changing over time. And the, the bottom line is that the top wealth group are, have been rising pretty fast, you know, 6-7% per year in real terms, whereas average wealth in the world has been rising at 2.1%, a bit faster than average income, 1.4, this is because of the increase in the wealth income ratio that I, I talked to you earlier. Note that more than half of world GDP growth in recent decades has been in effect absorbed by the growth of population. So growth of population is supposed to go to zero in the 21st century, but it's not there yet. Okay? So when we say the world is growing at 3, 3.5%, which is what we're going to have this year, uh, you know, half of it is, is world population growth. So we should not forget too fast about world population growth. Now, let me make clear that these peop the people in the top groups, they are not the same people, of course, over time. You know, there's a lot of mobility. So in 1987, uh, the people at the top of the list, according to Forbes, are Japanese billionaires, which everybody has forgotten their name now. And, and in 2013, you have Carlos Slim, you have Bill Gates. So there's a lot of mobility, and that's, that's fine. You, know, you have some people going down, some people going up. Now, if we were in an equilibrium of this mobility process, in principle, uh, uh, you know, the average wealth at the top should rise wealth for the entire world economy because these two effects of some people going down, some people going up should more or less uh, compensate each other. Uh, here, uh, the thing is that the average wealth at the top is rising three, four times faster than average wealth for the entire world, if we take this data seriously, which, of course, cannot continue forever. Because you know, if this was to continue forever, the share of world wealth going to billionaires would tend toward 100%, which everybody, I think, would agree would be too much. And so, I'm, you know, I'm not saying it will go to 100%. I'm sure it will, be st it will stabilize much below that. But where exactly will it stabilize? No, nobody, nobody really knows. And if you do simple uh, simulation or calibration using this kind of data, you can very easily see that this can go quite far. So why is it, uh, why is it going so far? Uh, it's, uh, you know, there are probably different explanations. Probably over this period of time, maybe many of the new world billionaires, you know, are not necessarily people who made uh, uh, huge inventions, but also people who benefited a lot from uh, privatization at relatively low prices. You know, Carlos Slim in, uh, in, in Mexico is an example. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, many uh, uh, billionaires uh, coming from uh, Russia or the Middle East. You know, it's not that they invented uh, oil fields or whatever. You know, and so, so this is this is playing a role in, the, in this world dynamics of billionaires. Other factors may include the fact 
that the rate of return to large wealth portfolio uh, uh, is likely to rise with the size of the portfolio. So this is data coming from the uh, uh, university on demand from the US. The, the only reason I'm showing this data to you now is because at least these people release uh, data. So, you know, for the Forbes people, we don't really know what they are doing. At least here we have publicly available data on, on portfolio. And you can see that, you know, the higher uh, the initial on demand, the higher the return, probably partly because of a size effect and scale effect in portfolio management. So when you're Harvard, you have uh, uh, 40 billion uh, on demand today, you spend only 0.3% of your on demand in management cost, but 0.3% of 40 billion, that's already more than 100 million a year. If this allows you to get a return of 10 rather than 8 or 6, you know, it's worth pay spending 0.3% a year. Now, if you have 100 million as on demand, you're not going to spend 100 million a year. And if you have 100,000 dollars, you know, you're going to ask your brother-in-law for financial advice and, and <laughs> probably that's not going to get you very far. So when we, when we talk about R and G, you know, it's important to realize that not everybody gets the same R. And even if the average gap between R and G is not huge, if, if you have this in the background, this can generate a lot of inequality. Let me uh, stop there, just mention that, you know, the, the, the ideal solution to correct this kind of process would be to have more transparency about wealth dynamics and to be able to adjust the tax rate on the different groups to, the, to, to what's happening. You know, if the top wealth groups are not really rising uh, faster than average, you don't need very progressive taxation. If, if, if there is a huge gap, then progressive taxation uh, might be uh, necessary. But mo most of all, I think what's important is to have more transparency so that we can adapt uh, the policy to whatever happened. Past history of taxation uh, is full of surprise. Uh, this is a brief history of the income tax in the past century. So you can see a century ago there was no income tax. Uh, many people thought in the US that the income tax will never happen. This was unconstitutional. And then it happened. <laughs> and now if you look at the, at the tax on wealth, inherited wealth, also it was supposed to be impossible at the federal level. And then it also happened. And so this is, uh, so you can see that US, UK have gone very far in terms of progressive taxation, which was really invented in the US, UK. And so when some people say today that this is contrary to US culture, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ignorance and historical amnesia there. You know, I think uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is history and that history is important. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the only time you see is Germany has very high tax rate on inheritance is 1946 to 1948, which is when the tax policy of Germany is set by the Americans. <laughs> you know. No, but this is not a joke. This was the Allied Control Council. And look, look for the income tax. This is when you have 90 percent in Germany. And, and when the Germans take their sovereignty back in 1949, Immediately, they reduce the top tax rate and they go down to 50% and they don't want to hear again about these crazy American levels of 90%. And this was the same in Japan, the exact same thing in Japan. Now, the Americans at the time were not doing this to punish the Germans or the Japanese because they were doing the same at home. So this was not a punishment. This was part of the, the civilization package, if you want. You know, you, the, the Americans of the time, the idea was to bring democratic institution and together with the democratic institution to bring the fiscal institution that will prevent democracy from becoming a plutocracy with excessive concentration of wealth at the top. Now, I know this can seem ancient history to you, but you know, this is not so old. And I think it's important uh, to, to look at this, you know, I, it's always difficult to have a quiet discussion about taxation. Uh, people get excited very fast when we talk about this, and many people clearly are not ready for that. But, you know, I think looking at history is important because this can be a way to quiet down a little bit the discussion and say, well, look at this historical experience. Let's try to evaluate it. You know, we have data. So, sorry for being so long. You know, the general conclusion is that the history of income and wealth inequality is always deeply political, social, cultural. It's not only an economic history. Uh, 
in a way, both Marx and Kuznets were wrong in the sense that you don't have deterministic forces pushing either in the direction of rising or diminishing inequality. It really depends on the institution, the policy uh, that we choose. Uh, the ideal solution involves a broad combination of inclusive institutions, including progressive taxation, education, social labor laws. You have more authoritarian solution out there, you know, like putting oligarchs in jail from time to time uh, in China or Russia. Uh, you know, I'm not sure this is working uh, very well. And, and so, you know, again, looking at this, all this experience, I think is important if we want to find a better solution for the future. So sorry for being so long and thanks a lot for your attention. Imagine I said to you, look, it's listening to your excellent talk, it's not obvious that wealth accumulation or the share going to capital is the big problem. On the one hand, as you say, much of the inequality we observe is labor related, human capital. And so it, whether it's because of skill bias technical change or the fact that you and I can talk here and be seen by people all over, which allows you to communicate with people in a larger market than you otherwise would, Factors like that are a big driver of inequality we see. And then with respect to wealth, looking forward, a key element of your book is this idea that an ever rising share is likely to go to capital. But I think that hinges on this assumption you mentioned about the RG comparison. So I'd like you to describe for the audience briefly what the controversy is among economists. Why some people believe that there are natural forces that would act in the direction of making R smaller than G. In particular, that as capital is accumulated, the marginal product of capital will fall, on the one hand. And as people get ever richer, it's not, it seems reasonable to suppose that they will consume more and more, reducing saving, and thereby reducing R. So tell me where I'm thinking about that the wrong way. Right, so let, let me first say that, you know, I, I, as I was saying in my talk, you know, I'm not saying that inequality will go to, you know, 100% of the wealth. You know, I'm sure it will stop before that. So, you know, the, I'm, all I am saying is that it could go very far, and I think that's enough to be concerned. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it will go uh, up to the sky. Uh, in particular, I'm, I'm not saying that the ratio of wealth to income uh, is going to go to infinity. If it was going to infinity, then of course the rate of return to wealth would go to zero. You know, if you have buildings uh, of infinite size and we all have uh, 10 floors uh, per family, you know, at some point the rental value of the extra floor will clearly be zero because nobody needs it. So, so there's no doubt about that. So I'm not saying uh, uh, this ratio of capital accumulation to income will go to infinity. I think it will, of course, it will stop somewhere. But it can stop at a level which is, which is pretty high, and I think that's enough to worry. Now, regarding uh, R and G, you know, I think it's important to realize that nobody, I think, is saying that you know, R will go below G, which will, be, which will be far too small. You know, it's important to have in mind that R bigger than G is, in fact, a, a condition for efficiency in capital accumulation. And it could, in itself, R bigger than G is certainly not a problem. So just to take an example, imagine uh, R is 5%, G is 1%. You could very well have a perfectly egalitarian society where everybody has an equal share in, the, in wealth through some gigantic pension fund and everybody owns the stock market. All what this would imply is that uh, with R equal 5%, G equal 1%, is that you, can, you only need to reinvest one-fifth of your capital income to ensure that your wealth uh, grows as fast as the size of the economy, and you can consume the other four-fifths of, of your capital income, which in a way, you know, is, is the very least you can ask from capital ownership, because if you had to reinvest more than your capital income just to make your capital grow as fast as the size of the economy, you know, what's the point of being an owner, you know, if you, mm -hmm. if you cannot even consume a bit more than if, without being an owner. So the whole point of capital ownership for a society as a whole, but also at the individual level, is to be able to consume a bit more. So, are bigger than G 
is what you get in every economic model, and, and, and this can be perfectly consistent with, uh, with, uh, with uh, perfect equality. Now, in practice, the problem is that not only you don't have perfect equality, but you have, as we've seen, much more concentrated uh, wealth than what you have for the concentration of income. Uh, that's due to many factors. This includes uh, very uh, uh, unequal financial returns, and this may have been uh, aggravated by uh, financial deregulation. You also have shocks to labor earnings, to demographic parameters, and for, for a given set of such shocks, a, a larger gap between R and G, particularly if you have high returns for large portfolio, will tend to amplify wealth inequality, which again will not go to infinity, but can go, can go very far. Um, so it's, uh, let, let me make clear that to me, the, the, the issue is not to be able to predict exactly how far it will go, which of course I'm unable to do. The, the issue is more to say, well, look, it will be too optimistic to just count on natural market forces to keep everything under control. You know, I, I believe in market forces, but I, I think we need strong democratic institution, uh, uh, financial transparency, in order to make sure that we can, uh, you know, adapt our policies so that, uh, uh, you know, indeed, the, the, you know, everybody can, can benefit from these powerful uh, uh, market forces. You know, just saying that, uh, you know, technological change, uh, supply and demand is going to take care of everything, you know, it's not, it's not consistent with the historical experience, okay. where we see lots of societies where concentration of, of income and wealth goes way beyond what can be justified by incentive uh, consideration. Sure enough. L let me ask you a slightly different question. Is it, is it the case that you are chiefly concerned about inequality in a generation, or is it that you're concerned about its dynastic consequence? By which I mean the following. My, my conjecture is that if I were to say to you that inequality in a given country fell from one generation to the next, that would please you. But suppose I were to say there's a different country in which inequality from one generation to the next is stable, however measured, but there is reshuffling across the generations. So that the set of people who are rich in generation two are quite different from the ones in generation one. Would you feel equally happy about those two um, alternatives I just laid out? Well, uh, clearly, uh, e mobility is, uh, is a key issue. So that's why, you know, when I've, I've, I have shown this graph on parental income and access to university, you know, that's very uh, upsetting. And that's very, uh, you know, I think all of us feel that this is not exactly what we would like it to be. You know, we would like to be closer to a, a sort of uh, equal opportunity uh, ideal. So, so, so that's, uh, you know, mobility is really the key issue. That being said, uh, mobility is not enough. So even if you had a complete reshuffling uh, from one period to the next, you know, look at these billionaire rankings that I showed before. You know, even if you had complete reshuffling, which is, of course, not the case. You know, you have always some persistence. You know, you have some mobility, but you have some persistence. But even with complete mobility, you cannot have, you know, average wealth at the top that's rising three, four times faster than the size of the world economy forever. Because otherwise, you know, that will mean that, you know, asymptotically, uh, all of the wealth belong to these top groups. Now, e even if the identity of these people is changing, you know, you, ca you can see that this is not good uh, to have uh, the, no wealth at all for the middle class and that you need to have, you know, I think this, the rise of the patrimonial middle class which I describe in my book, and which means that now, you know, this middle 40% in society uh, has access to wealth and has a significant share of national wealth in the US or in Europe. You know, I think this is a fundamental economic and political transformation, and, and uh, we, should be, we should be careful about this. So, mobility uh, uh, is important, but, you know, it's not enough to justify, you know, mobility cannot justify any level of, uh, of of concentration of wealth. We have to see whether it is useful. Okay. You know, that's the main, uh, the main thing. I want to make sure I get questions in from the audience and from our remote guests. So this question is from uh, Houghton, Houghton, Michigan. And someone asks, recent theorists on the left and some on the right have renewed the call for universal basic income. The person says that you yourself, in a recent issue of basic income studies, have spoken to this issue. Could you expand on some of the problems and benefits you see with this idea of basic UBI, universal basic income. So, yeah, I think the universal basic income is a very interesting idea. My, my only concern is that sometimes it is used 
uh, uh, you know, as a, as a way to say, okay, you you know, get your this cash transfer, and then you know, don't ask anything <laughs> else. And you know, we don't need you don't need to have a, a, a free access to education, to health, to uh, because you have this basic uh, you have this basic income. So to me. You know, basic income is interesting if it comes uh, together with basic access to these fundamental goods and rights and access to education and health. And uh, to be honest, I am more attached to this access to, to fundamental uh, uh, goods and rights uh, and opportunities than, than, the, than the unconditional uh, basic income. Except, maybe, you know, maybe for, for, for children, you know, universal family benefits, you know, I think is, uh, I believe more in that. But uh, to, to me, yeah, access to high quality education, health services is, is, uh, is, is the most important. Yeah, I, before I take another question here, something that occurred to me reading, listening to your talk and reading your books and papers is that since the war, certainly since World War I, the growth of the welfare state, broadly defined, has been astounding. And so if you look at people at the bottom 30% in Europe and the US, they receive many more public transfers in much more generous and varied, varying forms. Do your estimates of the share of, say, consumption going to the top 10 or 50th, whatever percent, line up with the evidence you've presented here? Yeah, well, I, I, I treat the issue of the, the rise of social spending, the rise of the social state and transfer separately from the distribution of market income. So in the first part of the book, I look at the distribution of market income, and then in the last part, of the book, I, I look at the rise of, of transfer and the, and the social uh, uh, state and, and spending, and, and indeed this has played a very important role, in particular for uh, uh, you know spreading access to these basic goods and, and uh, uh, you know raising uh, 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 life expectancy, and, and this has been uh, largely uh, uh, and, you know very successful. Now, taking into account this in-kind transfer into the our measures of income is something that we actually plan to do with my colleagues, uh, Emmanuel says, we're going to put online new inequality series for the US trying to include all this uh, uh, transfer. Wh what's complicated is that, you know, the value of in-kind transfer reflects, uh, you know, if you, if you think of the huge increase in the value of uh, Medicaid and Medicare mm -hmm. uh, in the past 30 years in the US, you know, this partly reflects uh, rising welfare for the uh, bottom group to receive this transfer, but this also reflects, uh, you know, rising welfare for the providers of these health services. And, um, and, and uh, you know, the relative price of yeah. health services has changed a lot over this period. So this is a, this is a complicated uh, issue when you have this in-kind transfer. So, so that's why, you know, so far we've, we did not do it, but we, okay. we plan to include them soon. So one of the questions from, one, from Ripon College touches not on what causes income inequality or its measurement, but touches on something here that we haven't talked about much, which is what are its direct consequences, if any. Um, so this person asks, how does wealth inequality impact innovation and research? So more generally, before we answer that question, I want to fold in a little bit more. So there's a view that um, inequality might matter in a kind of national and productive sense, because people at the top, among other things, set the rules um, they decide how we will speak and how that will be punished or rewarded, what kinds of technologies would be, invent would be invested in. Um, there might be consumption cascades. Their behavior causes people lower down to change their own consumption behavior. Their decision to live one place versus another raises rents in those places. That's not so. What aspect of the direct consequence of the well-to-do on the bottom, what is it about inequality's direct effect that most concerns you? Well, there are political effects which I, I would like to talk about, but, but for leaving the, this aside, you know, the, the main economic, uh, purely economic effect is that extreme inequality of wealth usually comes with uh, uh, a lot of perpetuation of inequality over time and limited uh, uh, mobility. And I, I think to me that's uh, uh, probably the, the most important uh, issue. So if you, took, if, you take, if you look at the long run, uh, you know, it's very striking to see that the, uh, you take all European societies until uh, World War I, uh, they have huge concentration of wealth. You know, 90% of the wealth to the top 10%. Uh, this has been reduced tremendously by very large uh, shocks, uh, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II. Mm -hmm. And the social and fiscal reforms that were uh, refused by the elite until World War I, that were finally accepted after these shocks, 
Wales concentration was much lower in Europe in 1950. Now, was, uh, what was the impact of growth on growth? You know, I think this reduction in inequality probably had a positive impact on growth because it helped uh, to generate uh, new mobility and the possibility for new social groups to access uh, economic responsibilities and to renew. So, uh, to me, you know, this experience of, of 19th century and pre-World War I, Europe is, is very important because in many ways it was a very modern economy. You know, sometimes I hear people in the U.S. tell me, oh, but, you know, we don't care about pre-World War I Europe because these were agrarian societies, you know, what, what do we care about? You know, it's a bit more complicated. You know, 1900, 1910, this is the time where uh, we invent, you know, the automobile, the electricity, the radio, so, you know, maybe that's less important than Facebook, but still, uh, these are... Uh, <laughs> You know, these are important innovations. And, and, uh, and at the same time, you have an incredible concentration of wealth, which, if, if anything, keeps rising until, until World War I. And, and I think that's not good for the, for the mobility and, the, and, 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 and you know, the reduction of inequality that took place in the 20th century overall was good, uh, including for, for growth and, and, uh, and, uh, and mobility. The political aspect of, of high inequality, to me, is maybe even more important. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think the, the, the problem with extreme inequality is that sometimes it, gen it contributes to generate uh, a lot of political tensions and political instability. And I think, in fact, that some of the reasons for the tensions in, in uh, uh, pre-World War I Europe have to do with the fact that when you cannot solve your domestic inequality problem in a peaceful manner, you know, it's always tempting to blame others mm -hmm. uh, to blame, you know, there are always people to blame for your problems. You can blame foreign workers or foreigners or, uh, or you can blame Germany, you can blame China, you can blame, you know, you can always find people to blame. And, and this is, uh, uh, to me, uh, the main concern with high inequality is that then people tend to turn to, to, uh, to other uh, uh, people to, to, to blame for that. And, and sometimes also extreme inequality leads to very uh, unequal access to political voice and political influence. And, you know, I think in the U.S. today, this is a, this is a serious concern. You know, someone in our audience asks exactly this question. She says, does the influence of money in U.S. politics, especially with regard to how it affects tax policy, explain the results you see in historical wealth and income inequality during the Industrial Revolution and in recent decades? What's your sense of that? Well, I, you know, I think the historical evidence is that universal suffrage, you know, is not enough to bring redistribution and, and it's not enough to bring the kind of democratic response to inequality that you would expect. And again, the experience of pre-World War I Europe is quite striking, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, you have universal suffrage, or at least for men at the time, but <laughs> that, that was not... Semi-universal. Yeah, semi-universal. So it was, that was not enough to bring a change. And, and partly, I think, because the elites were, were controlling uh, the political process uh, uh, in, in a way that, that made it's possible for them to resist to these changes. And I think today in, in the US, it's, it's possible that we have reached uh, this stage, uh, in particular the lack of a proper uh, legal system to limit the influence of private money uh, into, politic, uh, into politics and the financing of political campaigns. It's a, it's a very serious issue. In, in there are, uh, you know, in, in most European countries, you have very strong limits mm -hmm. on how much private money can buy. Uh, uh, into politics, you have public financing of political campaigns, you have uh, uh, access to, uh, to the media, uh, which, is, uh, which is important. You know, if you, if you have uh, uh, this you know, very unequal political uh, voice, you know, I think it clearly contributes to very unequal uh, uh, policy, uh, policy outcomes. So there's a real issue as, you know, what is democracy? You know, is uh, universal suffrage enough? Or do you need to have a legal system that guarantees Participation, uh, you know, so participation yeah. and, and so, you know, is the American political process democratic? I think this is a, this is a serious uh, issue to ask. An interesting aspect of your work, of course, is its global perspective. And several questions that have come to me, both here and remotely, touch on issues in other countries. So your work concentrates on uh, rich countries. Um, the U.S., Japan, Europe. One of our questioners here, an MPP student, asks or says, since the publication of your book, many questions have been raised regarding inequality in developing countries. What would you expect about the dynamics of wealth inequality in countries that are currently not rich, but that are developing? Do your results have um, 
Yeah, for, first, let, let, there. Yeah, let me apologize, you know, for the fact that emerging countries and developing countries are not as present in the book as they should be. You know, I, I should say it's not entirely my fault. It's partly because I was Fair not enough. able to access to the kind of data, historical data I need. And we are really trying hard, you know, I tried hard to, to use the historical data for India with Abhijit Banerjee, for China with Nancy Chan. So for a long time, I've, I've been trying to expand to this other country. We are now able to access more countries data in Brazil, in Argentina, and, and we, are, you know, we are putting a lot of energy into that. Now, regarding the, the, the conclusion and policy implication, you know, I think what, 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 what I have been saying about uh, wealth inequality and financial transparency uh, is, is a problem for rich countries, but it's even more of a problem for, for poor countries. If you, if you, if there are estimates of uh, offshore wealth uh, for different parts of the world, uh, in particular, there's a very, uh, very nice book by uh, Gabriel Zuckman, who's now at Berkeley, and who just published a book on the, the, uh, the missing wealth of nations, the hidden wealth of nations, trying to estimate the share of offshore wealth for different parts of the world. Now, for in Africa, it's like 50% of uh, uh, household financial wealth, which is offshore. So, how, you know, how do you want to have? Uh, um, um, you know, reasonable uh, democratic uh, debate about the tax system and how much you want to ask to the different groups in order to finance uh, uh, public infrastructure. You know, if you already know that half of wealth, you know, cannot be taxed and it's away. So I, I think, you know, we are talking about aid, you know, development aid to, uh, to Africa, etc. But I think, you know, many emerging countries, developing countries, it's not that they need aid. You know, they will need a legal system so that they, they are not, uh, uh, you know, they, they are not being stolen money all the time. And, and you know, the first thing that, that would help many of these countries is if we make it illegal for, uh, you know, multinational corporations from, uh, from Europe or from North America to, you know, go there and evade the, the tax system entirely. Uh, you know, we provide, uh, in effect, help to uh, wealthy individuals from these countries, you know, not to pay tax uh, uh, at all. So all these issues about uh, 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 financial uh, uh, opacity and, and wealth uh, concentration, you know, I think are, can be even more problematic in poor countries. Take China. You know, China, they, they, they say they want to fight corruption, which yeah, is, do so. you know, very interesting, but except that, mm -hmm. you know, this is... One of the, uh, you know, this is one of the few countries in the world where, you know, you have an income tax, but there's no income tax statistics at all. You know, there's no way to know. <laughs> there, there's no way to know, you know, how many taxpayers were at, you know, between 1 million and 2 million yuan last year, 2 and 3 million. You know, you don't, you don't even know. And I think publishing this kind of data at the local level, you know, would be a way also in some cases to realize that the tax system is not being applied the way it should, and it will be a way also for you know, the, uh, uh, the population to put pressure on the administration in order to improve the, the working of the, of, the, of the tax system. So I think all these, all these issues are in many ways you know, even more important for emerging uh, and developing countries than for, than for rich countries. So someone asks a policy-related question, which is very important to, to us here in the policy scale. Um, so she says, you hint in your book at various solutions to the problem that you describe. An international global tax, this is not her question, this is my observation, is one of the things you mention. But she asks more generally, look, what would a wealth tax not lead to dramatic flights of capital from productive uses? And does that not concern you? Uh, you know, I, I think governments uh, could improve their coordination, uh, uh, you know, on, on transmission of information. You know, look, a few, a few years ago, you know, people were saying, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, bank secrecy in Switzerland, uh, you know, there's nothing we can do. If we try to do something, that's going to be a disaster. And in the end, you know, it just took a few uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions against Swiss banks, uh, you know, asking uh, Switzerland, okay, if you don't want to transmit the information, well, you will lose your banking license in the U.S. And suddenly, the Swiss government accepted to change their law. So, you know, mm. I think the, I think it's not utopian to believe that we can improve transparency. And I think, you know, when you have uh, a trade uh, and investment uh, treaty between uh, the United States and the European Union, you know, when you're putting around the table uh, almost half of the world GDP, you know, 20, 25% for the US, 25% for the European Union. 
you know, you have the possibility to enforce, uh, you know, a number of, uh, of decisions uh, regarding uh, uh, financial transparency and exchange of information. So the view that governments, uh, you know, cannot do anything against uh, tax havens because that's, uh, that's uh, you know, they are too powerful for us, you know, is, I, I think, a bit... Uh, uh, I think a bit crazy. You know. So one, one reason, of course, that countries change is that um, they admit new people. And so migrants move all around the world and they bring with them um, their perspectives from the home country. They're often associated with problems of incorporating them into a new society, etc. We're facing a crisis here in Europe. Uh, one of our questioners from AF Chicago reminds us of a massive migration of Syrian refugees. And she wonders what the incorporation of these immigrants these migrants, will do the wealth and equality in, in Europe broadly, as best as you can, you can guess. Well, I think, you know, with better uh, social and economic policies, uh, Europe could uh, integrate a lot more migrants. And, you know, this is not a, a theoretical claim. You know, this is just based on the, on the following fact, which is that until 2008, 2010, uh, the net inflow of migrants in Europe was very large. It was actually it was about one million net uh, migrant inflow each year into the European Union between 2000 and 2010. And until uh, 2008, you know, there was no rise in unemployment. If anything, unemployment was reduced. I'm sorry, where were they going? Were they going to particular countries? Were they... Well, it, there were you know a lot in, uh, in 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 Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in France. You know, every, uh, Britain. You know, all the large uh, countries. Uh, you know, not so much in Eastern Europe. You know, Eastern European countries, you know, they have a strange attitude toward uh, uh, migration because at the same time, you know, they, you know, they, they, don't, uh, they don't want children and they don't want migrants. But then, you know, they're going to disappear. You know, if I, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, they're really going to disappear. Yeah. If you take, you know, United Nations uh, population projections, you take all Eastern European countries that are now in the European Union, now they are about 90 million uh, population, total population, according to the UN, they would be like 50 at the end of the century. So, you know, it's, it's uh, really... Uh, uh, and, and, and now, Germany has more migrants, but they have less children. France have, have uh, more children and less migrants. So, you know, there is some, uh, some, uh, some uh, equilibrium. But I think Europe, you know, could, uh, uh, could uh, welcome many more migrants with better social and economic policy. So, after the crisis, after 2010, uh, the annual flow of migrants into the European Union has been divided almost by three. It is now 300 to 400,000 a year, which is still uh, uh, positive, but as compared to a population of uh, 500 million inhabitants, this is a very small flow, much lower than the one million um, uh, that, that we had before. So, the, 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 you know, I, I, I think it's a, the, the one, that's one of the negative impacts of the, of the financial crisis and the way it has been uh, handled in Europe very badly, you know, very bad macro policy. Uh, the level of GDP uh, in the Eurozone uh, right now is still just at the same level as in 2007. We are still, you know, it's... Uh, so this has created uh, a rising unemployment and a lot of frustration and a lot of anti-foreigners' uh, attitudes. And, and that's, that's really sad because, you know, it's a big waste uh, uh, of time and a big waste of, uh, you know, opportunities for... for uh, uh, all these people, and, and uh, you know, I, I hope uh, uh, you know Europe is going to take a better, uh, a better track. Uh, now, regarding the Syrian uh, crisis, uh, to be honest, uh, the US is not really doing a great job right now. But you stumped me. I, 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 I don't, I don't have a good comeback for that. I, um, fair enough. So uh, when we look at inequality. Um, and you look at it as a scholar. Uh, are you concerned about its, its source? Or are you indifferent about its source and you're concerned about inequality per se? I mean, as, suppose someone could demonstrate that earnings inequality were exclusively the product of impersonal technological change. No one was trying to rig a system, and no one, you see? And that rising wealth inequality derived exclusively from impersonal, say, housing market appreciation versus the kind of targeted intertemporal transfers that some systems might have. Are you indifferent about what causes the inequality in terms of the degree to which it concerns you? 
Or instead, is it, the, as I said earlier, inequality per se? No, what causes inequality is really what's, what's key. If, if inequality results from different individual choices because different individuals have you know, different goals in life and you know, some want to work a lot and have a lot of uh, cash income and some prefer to spend their time differently, then there's, of course, no problem at all with, with, uh, with inequality. Now, in, in, in practice, uh, you know, in, in inequality is not just a consequence of different choice, you know, but it's consequence of all sorts of, uh, of shocks and, 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 and random events, and, and, uh, and it often goes too far. So the problem is, is extreme inequality, which I think is not useful uh, for, uh, uh, for society. You know, of course, you want managers to be uh, well paid, you want innovators to be well paid, but, uh, you know, is it useful to pay top managers 10 million dollars a year rather than 1 million dollars? You know, I could not find the evidence in the data I have used. You know, I couldn't find the, the, you know, the extra job creation or performance that could possibly justify this. So, you know, the view that you need to pay uh, managers 200, 300 times the average wage, uh, uh, otherwise uh, they will not accept to work because this is really too little money. Uh, you know, I think this is ideology. Okay, well, I, me, I think this is. Uh, but we, let me we say, have let, to, to let me say, okay, so that's a manager. But so there are other people who earn 300, 400 times what people in their field do. Beyonce. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so, what is it about Beyonce? She is, I'm told, a spectacular singer dancer. There, um, <laughs> there are lots of other singer dancers. Technology has changed in such a way that people can stream her and Twitter her, or whatever thing. Um, and so she earns 400 times what other singers do. Something about that seems fine to me. Mm. Am I thinking about this the wrong way? And if so, why? Well, you know, it's like footballers. You know, if, if, it's, if it's only a few uh, uh, footballers or, you know, who, who make uh, millions, you know, if they give you a good show on TV, you know, I think no, nobody cares. But it's also because people, you know, even if people don't have the exact statistic, you know, they know that footballers or Beyoncé or, or all these mm -hmm. people together, you know, they're not making 50% of national income, you know, because yeah. there, are, there are few, you know, even if they make a lot individually, these are few individuals. So they don't really matter in terms of macroeconomic share in income. What I have shown you in data are evolution where it actually matters. You know, it's not just a few individuals. It's, uh, we are talking about you know, a share of national income. You go from 30 to 50 percent. You know, are you going to go to 70 percent? You know, at, at some point, the, the numbers are important because this has really consequences uh, on the, uh, the, the income growth uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the rest of the, of the distribution in effect. So if you have very high growth, uh, you know, if you can take the case of the US in recent decades, if rising inequality had come with uh, extremely uh, good growth performance, you know, 5% growth, 10% growth, you know, Chinese growth rate, you know, after all, it's okay if two-thirds of the growth goes to the top 10%. The only problem is that, you know, the growth performance has not been particularly good by historical standards. So if you have 1.5, uh, 1.6% per capita GDP growth between 1980 and 2010, and if you have two-thirds of this growth going to the top 10 percent, then, uh, you know, is this a good deal for the rest of the population? Uh, it's, it's not clear because you have income stagnation. So it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, how much do you get? Mm -hmm. So for Beyonce, you get a lot for, for your money. But for the, if you take... If you take the top income groups and, and the financial sector and, you know, all the people who have made a lot of money and who have made this happen, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not sure the rest of the population got, uh, got, got what they should have obtained for, for their money. I'm going to exercise my prerogative and observe that you have, uh, this is your third event of the day, and you've maintained remarkable good cheer while dispensing great nuggets of wisdom. We are deeply appreciative of your having come and maintain this energy all the way through. I would ask the audience to thank me and joining you and join me. Back. And, um, thank you. And I would like to. The audience, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to tell our guests that we will have a reception where Tomah will be signing his books, and you can ask him a question or two there, but keep his talk all day. Um, <laughs> thanks again. Thank you.